ما شاء الله لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم حسن الله ونعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله قاصم الجبارين وبر الظالمين مدرك الحاربين وصلاة والسلام وتحية والإكرام على النبي الأمي المكي المدني الهاشمي الذي سمي في السماوات بأحمد وفي الأراضين بأبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى الجوهرة القدسية البتول الأزرى فاطمة الزهراء صلوات الله وسلامه عليها وبعلها أمير المؤمنين وقاعدا غر المهجلين وبنيها الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا ولعنة الله على أعدائهم قتلتهم وغاصب حقوقهم المكري فضائلهم العمين أما بعد قال المعصوم عليه السلام من عرف فاطمة حق معرفتها فقد أدرك ليلة القدر وإنما سميت فاطمة لأن الخلق خطم عن معرفتها For the happiness of Hazrat Zahra and Marzia For the enlightenment of the graves of the Omarhumeen Of the graves of the Shahada, Ulama and Siddiqeen For the safety of the followers of Ahlul Bayt around the world And for the safety and the hastening of the reappearance of Hazrat Baqiyatillah Al-A'zam Arawahu Al-Ibtada Please recite your loudest salawat Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali we praise due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who is Rahman and the one who is Rahim. It's an honor to be uh, given this opportunity to come and speak to you, brothers and sisters, to be back here in Sheffield. Um, again, I was sort of dreading that it would be a lot colder here than it is down south, but it's not so bad. Um, inshallah, I will also keep to my time and finish by the advertised time of 9 o'clock, um, inshallah. Uh, because I know people have work and things tomorrow as well, and school. And so, inshallah, we'll keep to that timing. Uh, please recite the loud salawat. We've gathered today to celebrate the birth anniversary of a lady that is beyond comprehension. No human being can comprehend that entity. In fact, the sixth Imam says, Man arafa Fatima haqqa ma'rifatiha faqad adraka laylatul qadr. Says the one that understands Fatima as his her right to be understood, it is as if she or he has discovered the night of Qadr itself. What is that night of Qadr? That night of Qadr that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran is addressing mankind and saying, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ How will you understand what the night of Qadr is? And then in order to place it within context, he says, لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ شَهَرِ It is enough for you to know that the night of Qadr is better than a thousand months. But beyond that, you cannot understand the night of Qadr Similarly, the sixth Imam says that if you were to understand Fatima as is her right to be understood, it is as if you have unlocked the night of Qadr itself. Then he continues, وَإِنَّمَا سُمِّيَتْ فَاطِمَةً لِأَنَّ الْخَلْقَ فُطِمُ عَنْ مَعْرِفَتِهَا But she has been named Fatima for this reason, that mankind will always be deprived of knowing her. No one can understand the entity that is known as Az-Zahra, that lady who the sixth Imam says, لفاطمة تسأت أسماء عند الله في مكعد صدق عند مليك مقتدر. What Maulana alluded to in his lecture that Sayyid Az-Zahra has nine names at the level of Indiyat of being with Allah. That woman whose names are with Allah. Imagine what her status would be. Says that her names are at that. But her names are at that level. And every aspect of her life, as we go through it, stage by stage, you will find that there is a uniqueness within her. The Holy Prophet 
five years of giving his prophethood, his message of prophethood, he is finally given Sayyidah Zahra. He, when does he marry Sayyidah Khadija? When he's at the age of 25. She at the age of 28. Not 40 or whatever else you heard. The same way that we reject 40 is the same way that we reject 9 in regards to other wives of the Prophet. She was 28, he was 25. The Holy Prophet marries her and spends this whole time. At the age of 40, he announces his prophethood. This whole period of his life and then the announcement of prophethood, then five years after that, Sayyidah Zahra is born. Twenty years of his life, he, is, he does not have Sayyidah Zahra. For twenty years, he has children. They die, and only five years after Ba'sad, he is given his daughter. But he's not just given her like this. No, there's many, many different narrations that all interlink as to how it is that Zahra came upon the earth. And I say came upon the earth because the Holy Prophet would look at her and say, Zahra Hur al insiya Zahra is Zahur in human form. That Zahra is not from here. Zahra is beyond this world. The event of Mi'raj happens. The Holy Prophet is raised from the earth and taken to the heavens. He ascends through all seven heavens, viewing different things at each level until he reaches the seventh point. And then from that point, he goes forward to the point where now Jibra'il says, I can't go beyond this. Only the son of Adam can transverse beyond this point. And when he reaches that point, he is given a fruit of heaven. And he's told, consume it. And only you can consume it. None other shall eat from it, not even Ali. Only you must consume it. He says, as I consume that fruit, I felt part of the essence of Zahra enter me. He returns back. The order comes. Don't go near Khadija. Forty days, stay in Ghar Hira. Forty days. Go within the cave, alone. And so for 40 days and 40 nights, the Holy Prophet is spending it within the cave. The order comes during the day, you fast, and at night, pray the whole night. This is the same Prophet that is being told earlier in the Holy Quran that, O oh Muhammad, only stand a little bit, only pray small amounts. You're praying too much, but now all of a sudden the command changes and the command comes now fast during the day and pray the whole night because something special is coming your way. 40 days, 40 nights, he's away from all of society in mystic seclusion, praying to his Lord, being ready, preparing himself to be able to receive something special on the 40th night at the time of Astar Jibra'il descends with a heavenly fruit, some say it was a pomegranate, says O oh Prophet O oh, do your iftar with this the Holy Prophet says as he broke open that fruit a light from it shone towards the heavens and Jibra'il said but bear in mind only you must consume from this, not even Ali can consume from it the Holy Prophet says I consumed it as well and again I felt a part of the essence of Zahra enter me. This Zahra is that lady that it requires Rahmatul Alameen, Khatim al Nabiyeen, to sit 20 years, go on a one heavenly journey, consume two heavenly fruits, and only then is he ready to receive Zahra. This lady is no ordinary lady. That now when she's in the womb of her mother and all of the women of Quraysh have boycotted her and there's no one around, the Holy Prophet comes home and he finds Sayyidah Khadija speaking to someone. He says to her, Khadija, who are you speaking to? There's no one in the house. She turns around and says, Ya Rasulullah, a janeen, a lady fi batni yahadithuni. 
says, Oh, Rasulullah, this child within my womb, she speaks to me. <laughs> Rasulullah says, Oh, Khadija, Jibra'il just came to me before and said that this child within your womb is no ordinary child. She will be from whom my progeny shall continue. She will be no ordinary child. And then when it comes to the time of the birth of Sayyidah Zahra, everyone has left her. Sayyidah Khadija is all alone. She herself narrates. She says, as I was there alone, not knowing who to turn to, says four women entered my home. The door was locked. But four women entered my home. I looked towards them. Their heights were like the Hashemite ladies. I turned to them. I said, who are you? They said, don't worry. We have been sent by Allah to be the midwives of this child that, ab- that is about to be born. She says that they aided me. The child was born. As she held Sayyidah Zahra within her hands, Sayyidah Zahra, her first words that she uttered, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna abi Muhammad Rasulullah. She says, I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah. And that my father, Muhammad, is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi And now she turns and begins to address each of her midwives. Who are the midwives of Zahra? She addresses each one of them. She says, Salam be upon you, O Asiya, wife of Fir'aun. Salam be upon you, Kulsum, sister of Musa. Salam be upon you, Sara, wife of Ibrahim. And Salam be upon you, Maryam, mother of Isa. <laughs> Every stage of her life is miraculous. Every stage of her life is unique. As she continues to grow. And the age of her marriage comes. And many people came. The narration are there. Their names have been stated. Who came to the Holy Prophet? And the Holy Prophet turned them all away. Said, no, this matter is with Allah. This matter is with Allah. This is not even my choice as to where Zahra should get married. Say Jibra'il descended. He uttered one word to Rasulullah, one sentence to Rasulullah. He says, Zawwaja Nura min al Nur. Says, marry the light to the light. Says, what do you mean? He says, give Zahra's hand to Ali. Every aspect of her life, you want to take her titles, you want to take her names, you look at the name of Zahra, the sixth Imam is asked, why is it that they named your mother Zahra? He says, because the nur from her face, when she would stand in the mihrab of Ibadat, illuminated the heavens for the dwellers of the heavens, like the stars illuminate the earth for the dwellers of the earth. I want to take this title of Ummu Abiha. The mother of her own father. One interpretation is that she showed so much love. She cared for her father such that he called her, you are the mother of your own father. In the same way that a mother takes care of her child. But yet, let's look at another interpretation. The word um in Arabic is often used for a mother. However, the word um itself does not mean mother. Rather, the mother possesses the characteristics of um. What is the interpretation of the word um? The first meaning of the word um is when something is the central point in a hand grinder, the middle part around which everything orbits or rotates, that point is called Um. So the sun is known as Um because it is in the middle and the whole solar system rotates around that which is Um. The central point is known as Um. Or then the second interpretation of Um is the place from which everything originates. The point of origin is 
is known as Um. This is why Mecca is known as Um al Qura, the mother of the earth, the point from where the earth expanded forth. Now come and listen to what Rasulullah is saying. He's saying Fatima Ummu Abiha, as if to say Fatima is that central point around which everything rotates, or as if Fatima is the origin of everything. This is why when you look towards the events of Mubahila, you find Rasulullah in front, Hassanain with him, Zahra in the middle, Amir al muminin behind. You come to the events of Kisa, Hum Fatima, Wa Abuha, Wa Ba'luha, Wa Banuha. Zahra is the center of all things. How will we understand who she is? How will you comprehend who is Sayyidah Zahra? There is one time where mankind may get a glimpse, may get a glimpse of the true nature of Sayyidah Zahra. And that is when everything will be destroyed. When the sun is extinguished. And the earth has been expanded. And the mountains have been raised from their place. And they've been crushed against the earth. Dukkatan wahida. In a single crushing. And a universal earthquake shall take place. And the sea shall become fire. And the moon will be destroyed. And the sun will be destroyed. And there shall be nothing that remains upon this earth. And all of mankind will be forced to rise up from their graves. And they will all stand upon the plains of the day of judgment. Not a single sound shall be heard. Imagine. All of existence from the start to the end. All of the existence from the start to the end. All of them standing there. Angels, jinn, human beings. And the sixth imam says the only sound that will be heard will be like the buzzing of bees. No one on that day will be able to speak. Let alone move. Let alone run. Everyone there on that day will only be in front of Allah. Allah will ask constantly on that day. Tell me, whose kingdom is it today? Lillahi wahid al That on this day, it is only the kingdom of God. At that moment, there are a few things that happen. I don't have time to go into them um, as to what precedes this. But they say that as mankind all stand on the plains of Mahshar, the caller will call out, where is Ahmed? Where is the Holy Prophet? And the Holy Prophet will come forward. And they say that a member of a thousand steps shall be brought forward. And Jibra'il will descend. Ya Rasulullah, ascend to the top of the member. Rasulullah will begin to climb this member of a thousand steps. When he reaches the height of this member, he will sit from the top and observe all of existence in front of him. Jibra'il will come to him, say, Ya Rasulullah, this is that maqam and mahmud that Allah promised you in Surah Al-Isra. This is that maqam and mahmud. Ya Rasulullah, today is your day. You do what you want. You send to hell who you want. You send to heaven who you want. What will be your first command on this day? They say Rasulullah will look across the plains of Mahshar. Now all of his, all of the will of God in the hands of Rasulullah. He can do as he pleases. He can send who he wants, where he wants. He has all of that authority in his hands. They say he will look across the plains of Mahshar and utter one sentence, one question. Where is Ali? Amir al Mu'minin will make his way forward and say, Ali, you too come. Amir al Mu'minin will ascend this member of a thousand steps. When he reaches the 999th step, Rasulullah will say, Ali, you sit there. At that moment, the keeper of heaven will come towards Rasulullah, holding the keys of heaven, and he will place them in the hands of Rasulullah. Say, Ya Rasulullah, today heaven is yours. You choose to do what you want. Rasulullah will take the keys and place them in the lap of Amir al muminin Ya Ali, heaven is for you today. The keeper of hell shall come with the keys of hell. 
place them in the hands of Rasulullah, the narration says now he will turn back to Amir al Mu'mineen and drop them in the lap of Amir al Mu'mineen. Say, Ali, hell is under your command today. Ali, today is the interpretation of why it is that we called you Qasimul Nari wal Jannah. Today, Ali, you choose who goes to heaven and hell. Today, heaven and hell are subservient to us in the same way that a slave is in servitude to his master. Says, as this is unfolding, a call will come out upon the plains of Mahr. Lower your gazes for Zahra angel. On this day, there is no hijab, there is no sharia. So, why the order of lowering your gaze? They say, because on that day, Sayyidah will manifest herself in her true celestial majesty. And if anyone were to look at her, they would instantly perish, not being able to view the majesty of Zahra. Says, lower your gazes, they say, she will enter riding upon a camel. The hands, the reins of the camel in the hands of Jibra'il, surrounded by the Muqarrabin, the Malaika, the closest Malaika, on one side, thousands, tens of thousands of malaika. On the other side, tens of thousands of malaika holding in their hands flags that have the praises of Allah inscribed upon them. And they will begin marching inside the plains of Mahshar. They say that where she sits, within it shall be the mercy of God. Outside it will be the forgiveness of God. And as she comes towards the doors of heaven, the order will come, Zahra, disembark, you enter into heaven first. As Sayyidah descends from her camel and she takes one step towards heaven, she will stop. The call will come, Zahra, why have you stopped? She will turn towards the Arsh, say, My Lord, Uridu an yu'arafa qadri fi hadha al-yawm. My Lord, I wish them to know my true worth on this day. Says the moment she says this, tongues of fire shall rise up from the depths of hell and consume every single one of the those that took away the hak of Zahra, those that oppressed the children of Zahra. Every single one of them will be dragged into hell, and then she will cast her gaze over the plains of Mahshar and see individuals who have been destined for hell, shackled, ready to be driven into hell, but inscribed between their eyes will be the line, Hada muhibbu Fatima. This is the lover of Fatima. Again, she will turn towards the Arsh. My Lord, what is this? These individuals, her lover, they claim to be my lovers, but yet they're being dragged towards hell. The reply will come, Zahra, today you do as you please. You take to heaven who you want. Imam al-Baqir says, my mother Zahra will begin to, cro- to, to begin to pass over the plains of Mahshar in the way that a bird flies across the earth and she will begin to pick people up and do shifa for them, entering them into heaven in the same way as that bird glides over the earth and it begins to pick seeds off the earth, the same way she will pass over the plains of Mahshar, interceding for all those that loved her in the dunya. How can we understand who she is? That they that are known as the Hajjah of Allah upon the earth say that yes, we are the Hajjah of Allah over you, but she is Hajjah over us. How can we understand that lady who the finality of every message from every Nabi, from every Wali, from every Imam, the finality, 
the culmination of every single divine message of God exists within the wujud of the Imam of our time. He is the finality of every single message. He is the culmination of every single a revelation that came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and even he is saying in the example of the daughter of Rasulullah for me is the best of examples for me is the greatest of role models so what is it that we can take from her because Ahlul Bayt did not come just for us to hear their stories they did not just come for us to weep over them. Nor did they just come for us to listen to their fada'il, go home and feel good about ourselves. Rather they came as a guide. Every single one of them as a guide. To take mankind towards that perfection that he was destined to achieve. The aim of mankind is what? The ma'rifah of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Hadith Qudsi says, Kuntu kinzin nafsiya. I was a hidden treasure. Fahbadtu an a'raf. And I desired, I loved that I be known. Fakhalaqtu al khalqa likay a'raf. So I initiated creation so that creation may come to know me. The aim of mankind is to gain an understanding, a knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ahlul Bayt are conduits. Ahlul Bayt are those that will guide us on that path towards the ma'rifah of Allah. They exist only because Allah allows them to exist. They do not exist independent of Allah. Ahlul Bayt point us towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ahlul Bayt take us towards that ma'rifah. Why else would Amir al Mu'mineen stand in the middle of the night? Mawlaya ya Mawla. The, the Masjid Kufa is hearing the cries of Ali. Why is it that he would cry out in Munajat Sha'baniya? Ilahi wa in adkalta lin nar a'alantu ahlaha anni uhibbuk that even if you were to throw me into the depths of hell, my Lord, I would still announce that I love you. Because Ahlul Bayt taught us, we're here to teach us about the love of Allah. The aim was to fall in love with Allah. Why else would say the Shahada stand or uh, ride up on his horse for the final time after having given everyone in the way of Allah look towards the heavens Ilahi taraktu al-khalqa turran fi hawaka wa itamtu al-ayala likay araka wa inkata'tani bil-hubbi iradan irada limal al-fuadu ila siwaka my lord I have left the whole of creation for your sake I've orphaned my children so that I may see you and even if the swords were to come and cut me to pieces, my heart would turn to none but you. Ahlul Bayt came to teach us how to fall in love with Allah. They came to teach us the adab, the ways, the mannerisms of being in love with Allah. That even if it meant that you give up your own desires, in order to protect the Imam of your time, then standing between the wall and the door is okay as long as Ali is okay. The message that we gain from Sayyidah Zahra, that dedication to her Imam, much of her sayings are hidden, much like the personality. But the most amount that we gain from her in one single moment <coughs> is within khutbah sadiqiyah. In that khutbah that we often cry about, we often think about it, we cry about it, we say, why is it that she went? But I've never really read it. See, I say this often and I've said this here before, that Ahlul Bayt were mazlum then. 
at the hands of their enemy. That Amir al Mu'mineen would take Kumail into the desert and say to him, Kumail, ha huna ilman jama'a. That here there is great knowledge, there's no one to take it from him. Ali was mazloom then because no one wanted to hear what he had to say. No one wanted to take that knowledge. But he was mazloom at the hands of his enemies. Today Ali is mazloom at the hands of his Shia. Each of us have Nahjul Balagha within our homes. How many times have I sat down to read it? Sayyidah Zahra was mazlooma then because no one wanted to listen. She is mazlooma now because I've never read Khutbah Sadatiya. I've never read to see what is it that she actually said. Within it she explains the philosophy, the philosophy of 20 worship. Why is it that God gave you salah? Why is it that he gave you iman? Why is it that he made fasting incumbent upon you? What is the purpose of zakat? What is the purpose of hajj? Why is it that khums is there? What about amr bil ma'roof and nahi anil munkar? What is the purpose of imamat? She explains it all there. And from the start to the end of the narration, there is lesson after lesson. From the moment the khutbah begins, they say, and they gathered within the masjid and they began to discuss. And they came to her and they told her that they are beginning to discuss the matter of Sadr. La tat khimaraha ala ra'siha. She placed her khimar upon her head. Khimar is like imama like thing, a cloth that you wrap around your head so that the shape of the head cannot be seen. Washtamalat bijilbabiha. And she enveloped herself within her jilbab. A jilbab is a long flowing chadr like thing which covers up until the wrist and goes way beyond the feet along the ground. And she surrounded herself with the women of her nation and those that, the women of her family and those that were close to her. And her clothing was dragging along the ground. And she began walking and we noticed her walking was like the walking of Rasulullah. She entered into the masjid فَأَنَّتْ أَنَّا But before that she entered into the masjid, ordered that a curtain be erected. Now here is Zahra in all of this hijab, that there is the hijab of the curtain, the hijab of the women that surround her, the hijab of the khimar, the hijab of that chador. And she let out a cry. And they all began crying, hearing her voice. And when they stopped, she began her khutbah. I don't want to go through the whole khutbah. I want to select a couple of points in the last seven or eight minutes that I have <coughs> to go through to try and understand them. When it comes specifically to the philosophy of worship, the first thing that she says in that part, she says, فَجَعَلَ اللَّهُ إِمَانًا تَطْهِيرًا لَكُمْ مِنَ الشرك. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained iman for you as a purification from shirk, from polity. Iman has been given to you to purify you from the lowly place that is, or from the dirty, nejis place that is known as polytheism. Shirk, this is quite self-explanatory, but shirk is not so black and white. Shirk isn't me just worshipping an idol. <coughs> shirk isn't just me saying things like Ali Rab or Ali Khalid. That shirk is, that's known, that's known as shirk al jali the open shirk. Those, those people are mushrik, they're kafir, they're najis. There's, there's no uh, discussion. The other side is shirk al khafi. This is more nuanced. This is more difficult to understand. This shirk is when I place something above or on the level of Allah, even at the subconscious level. For example, the football is on. Um, forgive me if I say some 
you know, terms that are incorrect, I can't stand the game of football. So <laughs> I probably will get things wrong. Um, so football is on and you get to your half time. Or, you know, the time of Salah comes and everyone says, you know what, I'll just pray at half time. Placing something above Allah. This is shirk al khatib The cricket is on and I say, I'll wait because it's Pakistan versus India and, you know, I'll wait till the tea break to pray. This is shirk al khatib That I place something above Allah. I give precedent to something over my duties to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we do it on a day-to-day basis, constantly. I'm working, I'm too afraid to ask for a place to pray. So I say, you know what, I'll just go home and pray. There's still going to be a bit of time later on. I can maybe knock out ten minutes before sunset. Or I delay my prayer. I say, I don't want to look like a, you know, an extremist at work. So I'm just going to go home and pray qada. This is shirk al This is that hidden shirk. Or I place, for example, an exam. I have an exam tomorrow and I want to wake up fresh for it. So I decide to miss Salat and Fajr so that I can wake up fresh for my exam. This is Shirk al This is that hidden Shirk. And it becomes more and more nuanced. When we move on to the second thing that she t- says, this is also part of that Shirk. The second line that she says within it is that and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was salah Allah has prescribed you salah tanzihan lakum an al-kibr in order to raise you from the degradation of pride Allah has ordained namaz for you to raise you from the lowly from the dirty place that is known as pride we often view pride as something like a badge of honor I said, oh, this is what I'm proud of. You know, this is what stops people from saying bad things to me. This is my proud. This is my pride. I descend from Rasulullah. This is my pride. Or I have this much education. This is my pride. Or I can speak in this way. This is my pride. Or I am an individual that has a, you know, this amount of money. Or my children are this successful. This pride. All of it, all of it, every example that I have cited, if you are proud over it, you have entered the realms of filth. Pride is the lowest place that anyone can go to. They asked one of the Arafa, said the narration says that a person with a sand grain's worth of pride in their heart can never enter into heaven. What is the lowest form of pride? He said, even if you're proud on the laces that are in your shoes, you will never enter heaven. And I'm proud of my children, I'm proud of my education, I'm proud of my looks, I'm proud of my eloquence. All of these various things that I still hope to achieve some sort of proximity to Allah or Ahlul Bayt. It's impossible. And pride is so acute a disease of the soul that it can manifest in various ways and we don't even realize it. I'm not sure if I've given you this example here before, but one example I give everywhere I go about how acute and nuanced pride as a disease is, is the one of the shoe rack. Every Husseiniya, every masjid that you go to, Everyone has a shoe rack. I'll explain. (laughs) All of them have a shoe rack. And by and large, all of them have a sign that says, please place your shoes on the rack. And 98% of the ones that you go to, all the shoes are on the floor. Two or three shoes on the shoe rack. So I think, okay, what's what's the problem with not putting my shoes? Number one, there could be a number of issues. The first is I've committed zon, oppression. How did I commit oppression? Oppression is when one country bombs another. No. Oppression is far smaller. Oppression is to take something from its rightful place and place it somewhere where it does not belong. 
That's oppression. You see, it, it's placed as the shoe rack, but I've placed it on the floor. Oppression. One. Number two, someone might be walking past my oddly placed shoes, cause them to trip and fall. Oppression. Someone has to take an even a half an inch extra step, a, exert effort of even half an inch over my shoes. I have done zulm upon them. That's one thing. Why is it that I did it? Well, the first reason could be, you know, um, the floor was wet. I didn't want to get my, sho- uh, my socks legit. So I brought my shoes right to the end where it says, no more shoes beyond this point. And then I stepped in. Or the second reason could be that, you know, I, I was getting late. Namaz was starting. I wanted to rush to Namaz. So I thought, I need to get there. So I took my shoes right to the last point, took them off, and I went. Or the third reason could be that I looked at the sign and said, no, my dad set this center up. That doesn't apply to me. All three of these are manifestations of pride. All three of these will stop me from entering into heaven. All three of these. Why? Because in the first instance, when I took my shoes off and I said, no, they may become nudges, in some way I thought my socks better than everyone else's. Stop me from entering because I had pride in my socks. The second, that's no, I was in a hurry, I'm going to miss. In some way, my salah is more important than someone else's that now has, de- has to be delayed because they're stepping over my shoes. The third, my dad set this center up, or I'm on the committee, it doesn't apply to me, this is about everyone else. Well, that's obvious. Two things from Sayyid al-Zahra. The first, Iman was given to you as an exaltation, as as a purification from polytheism, because Iman and Islam are two different things. Islam is when you just simply say La ilaha illallah. When you say the uh, when you say the Shahadatain, this is Islam. Iman is when you put it into your actions, and this is what she, Salam Allah alayha, says in the Khutbah herself. She says Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, kalima tujala li khalas al taawilaha. Says that I bear witness that there is no god but Allah. A statement whose true interpretation is only understood when it enters into the actions of an individual. When my every action says La ilaha illallah, then I have understood what Iman is. When I'm conscious of La ilaha illallah, every moment of my life, from the moment that I wake up to the moment that I sleep, and then those moments that come in between, if every aspect is la ilaha illallah, would my Lord be happy about this? Would my Lord be happy about this? This is iman. And when you enter iman, that's when you come out of shirk. Until that point, you still wallow in the pits of shirk. And then salah has been given to you as an exaltation from pride. Because no matter how good looking I think I am, no matter how eloquent I think I am, no matter how rich, no matter how good I think my children are, no matter, you know, whatever I'm proud of, how cool my hair is, no matter what it is, five times a day, I'm placing my head upon earth and saying, no matter what I am, subhana rabbi ala wa bihamdi, you are still greater. That's why it's an exaltation from pride. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives our sins. Pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives the sins of our parents. Allah, those of our parents that are alive, give them long life. Those of our parents that have left this world, give them a safe return. Muhammad and Jannah. Oh Allah, those who are ill, give them shifa. Those who are in debt, pay their debt. Oh Allah, those who are in education, make them successful. Oh Allah, keep safe the Shia of Ali Muhammad around the world. Oh Allah, destroy the enemies of Tashayya, both internal and external, around the world. Oh Allah, keep our ulama and our maraja at the head of our institutions. Oh Allah, hasten the reappearance of the Imam of our time and allow us to be amongst his true mentors and his true awakers for the acceptance of these du'as and any other du'as that the brothers and sisters have brought to on this night. Please recite three loud salat on Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Oh.